Many iconic monsters and demonic apostles in Berserk fear the blade of the Black Swordsman. But you know the saying, you always remember your first. And while that isn't strictly true in the Count's case, we're treating it as such because he was the first apostle to have a drawn out battle with Guts all the way back during the Black Swordsman arc. Sure, you'd seen him slay a couple of apostles and a possessed little girl so far, but you'd never quite understood what that meant. It's with the introduction of the Count that readers truly grasped just how depraved the existence of an apostle truly was, and so we thought, hey, why not explore his origins as well? So without further delay, this is the Slug Count's origins, explored. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you, let's begin. He's one of the focal points of the Eclipse, Slug Count's chronological introduction. Technically, the Slug Count doesn't enter the story of Berserk during the Black Swordsman arc. He was in Guts' life well before that. You could even say that he was one of the reasons why Guts became the ruthless Black Swordsman, and the reason behind that is first glimpsed in Chapter 52. In the previous chapter, Rickert was asked by one of his comrades to fetch a pail of clean water for their encampment. The young mercenary returned with said pail, only to find all his comrades lost to the darkness of the woods. The band of the Falcon soldier who had asked Rickard to perform that duty then reappears, hanging upside down from the shadows for some reason, and urges the young man to do one thing only, run. The reason for his terrified plea is revealed in the next panel. The lower half of his body was becoming the Slug Count's pre-feast snack. The monstrous apostle then sets its sights on Rickard, but is scared away by Skull Knight's sudden appearance, who reminds the detouring party that they had somewhere else they needed to be. Where was that? Well, that would be the Eclipse site where we see the slug count for the second and last time in Berserk overall. He is spotted briefly in chapter 80 as all the apostles prepare to indulge in their feast, and then in chapter 85 engaging in said feast. A bloody and battered Guts stumbles around the interstice, searching for anyone who could have survived. He comes across Pippin's visage atop a hill of tortured faces and is drawn to it, but it turns out he is too hopeful. The slug count reveals himself from behind Pippin, disassembling his corpse from the bait he had arranged it into, and advancing on Guts to claim the sacrifice. This is the last time we see the Slug Count on the pages of Berserk as a whole, but not exactly the last time Guts meets him. See, the Eclipse takes place towards the end of the Golden Age arc, which is the second major arc of the story. The first few chapters of the Golden Age arc are prequels to the story that set up Guts's character and his relationship with Griffith, with Berserk's first official chapter beginning with the rise of Griffith to Viscount status. But while the second arc of Berserk is a years-long setup for the tale of Guts and Griffith, the very first arc of the story is what some consider to be Berserk's glory days to this very day. And that's probably because this is when Guts was at his darkest. The Black Swordsman arc that opens Kentaro Miura's seinen masterpiece is set two years after the events of the Eclipse, which explains why Guts is hunting down apostles in the first place. As we know now, he's on a quest for vengeance. This quest for vengeance leads him to take the lives of multiple apostles, until he finds himself with the female apostle that killed Corcus during the Eclipse. Guts takes care of her with ease, and dispatches the Snake Baron within the same chapter to establish his Gigachad Beast Slayer status. But in the third chapter, Chapter of Berserk, we get an idea about the nature of these things he's fighting, and that is where the Slug Count resurfaces in the story. He rules his city with an iron fist and naked fear, the Slug Count's fanatical regime. After Guts dispatches the Snake Baron in the city of Koka, he comes across an execution that is being held in front of the castle of a nameless city. What we can deduce about the place is that it most likely falls under the Holy See's jurisdiction because the execution above is being held on the grounds of heresy. After performing his duty, the headsman allows the severed head of the heretic to fall into the crowd as the Count's minister tries appealing to his sire to reduce the number of executions he was sanctioning. The Count dismisses his advisor's concerns with regard to his extreme measures because his deepest desire was to ensure the safety of his subjects, and the only way he felt he could do that was by executing anyone who even looked like a heretic to his eyes. As he explains, his rationale to his terrified spokesperson, a hooded man picked up the head of the executed heretic and flung it at the Count, who managed to catch it without hesitation. He noticed the commotion in the crowd caused by an injured guardsman, 
But what captured his attention was the symbol marked on the gift he had just received, a brand of sacrifice drawn in blood. As the Count searches the gathered mob for the offender, he locks eyes with Guts, who uses the blood oozing from his brand of sacrifice to make a slashing gesture across his throat, taunting the Count with warfare. The Apostle recognizes the man as the Black Swordsman, and seems delighted by the prospect that he's declaring war upon the Count and demonkind in general. The Count's excitement causes him to forget what he's holding in his hands, and the thing bursts into bits like an overripe melon. If you want to know what said thing is, go read Chapter 0C of Berserk, because we don't want YouTube to take down our channel. But having been provoked in such a public setting, the Count could not let Guts escape unscathed, so he immediately sicked his guards on him including his best fighter, Zondark, who managed to corner Guts in an alleyway. Outnumbered and outmaneuvered, it looked like this was the end of the line for the Black Swordsman, but Guts' insane battle IQ and even crazier Dragon Slayer helped him escape a seemingly impossible situation once again as did a certain bandaged man. This man's intervention with smoke bombs allowed the Black Swordsman and his reluctant companion Puck to escape into the city's sewers. After re-emerging in a safer side of town, their savior explains that the only thing that keeps their settlement running is fear. Fear of their dreaded execution crazy leader. He leads Guts and Puck into a rundown building whose insides could get the older man tried as a heretic himself. But the man isn't worried, as what the pair were seeing now were the remnants of his life as a physician. The bandaged man then asks Guts what business he has with the Count, and whether it could involve revenge. The Black Swordsman roughs him up instead, telling him that he was the one asking questions. But as the fallen savior rises to his feet, both Guts and Puck are left speechless. It turns out that the bandages weren't there just for anonymity. Half of the man's face had been torn away from its bones as if some creature had mauled him for breakfast. His legs weren't legs, but wooden stumps on which he balanced himself with a cane's assistance. The bandaged man is not offended by Guts's treatment of him because he wants something in return. He wants the Black Swordsman to slay the demon that tore him apart piece by piece and turned those pieces into his dinner. He wants Guts to kill the Count. The man thinks to himself that this random stranger, no matter how strong he might be, would never believe him. But to his surprise, not only does Guts agree, but he also explains to him what his former master had become. That's right former master, because this man's name was Vargas, and he used to be the Count's lead physician until something happened to the latter that changed him forever. Vargas revealed a secret room in the life lab to Guts and Puck that housed a behelet, and then began explaining why he wanted to ally himself with Guts in the first place. Also, if any of you want to know what a behelet is, do check out our Behelet Explained video before you continue with this one. But getting back to Vargas' story, seven years ago, the Count was a relatively normal man, cruel and fanatical still, but not yet demonic, which is why Vargas continued to serve him. But then, one day, as he was returning to the castle, the Count received a behelet from some traveling merchants, and things changed forever. Even the merchants didn't know where the object came from, only telling the Count's party that they bought it from a bazaar in the east. But after he received it, the Count was undoubtedly not the same man that Vargas used to know. His fanatical inquisitions went from a holy quest to a personal indulgence as the Count began experimenting and feasting on his subjects at an obsessive rate. When Vargas tried to escape the castle with his family, the Count personally tormented Vargas before giving his wife and children the grisliest ending imaginable in front of his very eyes. At that time, more than anything else, Vargas felt like a prisoner to his fear. So after faking his death with a certain substance, Vargas escaped the castle with the Count's behelet in tow. He had waited seven years to meet someone like Guts, and didn't care how lowly he was perceived as being as long as his heart's desire was fulfilled. He gave Guts a layout of the Count's castle and begged him to kill the Apostle and avenge his family. But before the Black Swordsman could locate the Count, the Count found him. Using Zondark as a pseudo-apostle vessel driven by the same sense of hatred for the Black Swordsman, the Count broke into Vargas's home and engaged Guts in battle. Their encounter was so fierce that it caused the entire place to cave in, and Zondark was seemingly killed in the process. But after Guts and Puck took their leave of Vargas, he was dragged back into his ruined home by Zondark's possessed body and presented to the same mob Guts had seen at the beginning of this section as yet another heretic and traitor to their domain. This was an an obvious ploy by the Count to lure out the Black Swordsman, and Guts knew it, which is why he didn't step forward to save Vargas, but Puck did. 
which caused him to be captured by the Count instead. As he commented on the look of defiance in Vargas's eyes, the Count was met with words whose gravity he didn't yet understand, but he would soon enough. Before taking his dying breath, Vargas told the Count that death would be visiting him soon enough, and yelled out for the black swordsman to hold up the Apostle's head for his subjects in retribution. After the headsman's axe meets Vargas's neck, Guts follows the guard's commission to dispose of his remains and disposes of them, vowing not to fail in his vengeance as Vargas did. Meanwhile, the Count prepared to meet the black swordsman in a showdown that explained a lot about the world of Berserk, including how and why apostles are made. A demonic slug on the outside, a loving father on the inside. The Count's origins revealed during his final showdown with the Black Swordsman. Guardian Angels of Desire Part 3 opens up with the Count paying a visit to the one person who still tethers him to his humanity, his daughter, Teresia. He has brought Puck to her as a gift, thinking that the presence of a real elf would compel her to finally forgive him and allow him to touch her again. But Teresia remains unmoved, and the Count remains a loveless father. After exiting her chambers, the Count asks his minister Dahl to leave him at once his rage causing his apostle form to come over him. But excitement halts the process when he senses the black swordsman entering his castle. The Count sends Pseudo Zondark to meet with Guts in his stead, and their second encounter is shorter than their first, but far fiercer. Zondark has a few upgrades with respect to his limbs and their sharpness, and he manages to cut up Guts pretty well, but the Count's arrogance ends up becoming his undoing. In the process of gloating about his undying body, the Count reveals that his head is his only weakness, which Guts immediately exploits. Though he's lost a lot of blood, the Black Swordsman is unwilling to give up after coming this far, and the Count tells him, through Sondark's dying head, that he will be waiting for him upstairs. The scene then shifts to Teresia's room, where she's trying to get Puck to come out of his cage. But he's not in the mood to become dinner that evening, thank you very much. Teresia understands why that's the case given her father's reputation, and then breaks into a story about what happened seven years ago that changed him forever. In those days, the three of them lived together, Teresia, the Count, and his wife, Teresia's mother. A sect of heretics kidnapped the Count's wife and demanded that he make pagan worship official in his land. But being a devout man, he refused. In response, the heretics offered up Teresia's mother as a living sacrifice, and that was when her father became obsessed with his inquisition, and the rumors began about his sinful appetites. Teresia remembers that before this incident, even though he might have been harsh, the Count was a great ruler loved and trusted by all, even his family. But after that day, it became as if her father didn't even care about the problem of heresy anymore. It seemed like he simply enjoyed hurting people. Teresia lets all her despair out in a flurry as she cries that her father isn't even human anymore, and the Count goes on to prove her right. He sends wave upon wave of soldiers after Guts, who manages to defeat them all, and finally comes face to face with him in the throne room. Considering that Guts defeated a man thrice his size, the Count is rightfully impressed with his powerful display, but he eggs on the human to show him what he can do, and that's when the real fight begins. The Count tries to fake out Guts with an attack from beneath the ground, but the Black Swordsman also counters it and its follow-up. The Apostle is even more impressed by him than he was before, but he has grasped the extent of his skills. He declares that he too shall take this fight a bit more seriously, and transforms into his released state. This form is why the title of this video is The Slug Count. What this man becomes can only be described as the most terrifying slug human kaiju we've ever seen. He's got one face, but two mouths, and one of those mouths is bigger than the other. He also has slug-like eyes, but he's far more massive than a million slugs combined. It's a lot to digest. His skin is slimy like a slug's, which makes him far more durable than any regular enemy, but when you chop off his limbs, they regenerate and make him bigger, which means he'll only grow in size and strength the longer the fight draws out. Armed with this knowledge, the Count begins his devastating advance on Guts, leaving the Black Swordsman reeling and the Count's castle in shambles. Guts tries playing hide-and-seek with the Count, and uses Dahl as a decoy to get a slash in at his head, but it only causes a surface wound and ends up exposing him to the Apostle. The Count gleefully thrashes Guts about while both praising and criticizing him, praising him for being a first-rate warrior for being able to have come this far, but berating him for thinking he could escape divine providence. That he bore the brand of sacrifice meant he was preordained to end up as a sacrifice for demon kind, his soul eternally bound for hell. But he had managed to come this far through the sheer strength 
of his sword, and the Count respected that. He treats Guts like a ragdoll, slamming him into pillars one after the other because he wouldn't let go of his sword. But when the Black Swordsman falls upon the ground, the Slug Count smells victory. He advances upon Guts, speaking words of assurance. It was meant to be this way. He was a sacrifice, after all. He had outdone all of humanity in having come this far. There was no shame in putting the sword down and meeting his destiny at this point. After all, he was just a fragile human. But that last statement marked the beginning of the end for the Slug Count, because he was talked down to by Puck of all people. The resident chestnut of Berserk laid into the Count about talking down to Guts for being a human when his own fragile humanity had caused him to become a demon in an ironic attempt to stop the spread of heresy. Puck called the Count a pathetic fragile human to his face, which seemed to strike a chord with him because he decided to spare Puck's life for his speech despite finding him too talkative. Puck, being Puck, refused and sealed his own fate when he flew away with Betchy, which is also known as the Count's Behelet. This infuriated the Apostle, who began chasing the elf with all his might, but he stopped dead when Teresia entered the throne room looking for Puck. For the first time in either of their lives, father and daughter saw each other for what they truly were. Teresia, a caged bird just freed from imprisonment, and the Count, her jailer, and a literal demon on Earth. Despite being in his monstrous released form, the Count's paternal instinct kicked in, and he instinctively went to touch Teresia, but she ran away from him, terrified by his appearance and with good reason. Driven into despair by the fact that the cat was out of the bag, the Count turned his rage onto Puck and advanced on him with murder in his eyes. But before he could get there, Guts threw some knives at the Count's face and re-entered the fray. He used Teresia as a diversion to send a cannon blast into the slug demon's chest and then decapitated it, using the Dragon Slayer with his literal teeth. Guts cornered the Count's head and began tormenting it with his knife, which drove the latter into deep despair. After exposing his true nature to the one person he had hoped to shield it from, the Count had nothing to live for, and yet he didn't wish to die. He was so desperate to live that he yelled out that phrase multiple times in the middle of Guts fatally explaining human fragility to him. His deep desire to live, his deep despair at losing his daughter's love, and his blood all co-mingled within the behelet which activated. A whirlwind descended on his castle, which took all present to an interstice, where the Count was reunited with his guardian angels, the five members of the God Hand. Guts immediately leapt for the God Hand member who appeared to be wearing a falcon-themed helm on his head, but the Count pleads to their leader to deliver him from his enemy. He pleads to Archangel Void to kill the Black Swordsman, the slayer of apostles and enemy of demon kind, to satisfy the sacrificial ceremony ceremony, but to his horror, he is rejected. The God Hand members explain that in order to make the sacrifice work, he had to give up something that defined his humanity, not an enemy who didn't even matter to him a day ago. When the Count asked them the dread question, Femto gave his answer. He had to sacrifice his daughter if he wanted to be reincarnated again. The Count hesitates at this, but it seems that his wish is granted regardless because Femto nearly kills Guts with a swipe of his hand, and yet it isn't over there. Archangel Void had already called for the Invocation of Doom, whereby he would brand the sacrificial offering and give their soul over to demon kind. The Count tried to dissuade them from picking Teresia, but they persisted in making him do that very thing. They reasoned that he should just follow his own example and do what he did last time, which piques Teresia's interest because she doesn't know the truth yet. So Ubik takes it upon himself to show it to her, and this is where we learn about the Count's true origins. Seven years ago, the Count did set out on an inquisition to take out a dangerous sect of heretics, but it wasn't them who took the life of his wife. When he returned to his castle, he was shell-shocked to find the very pagans he had set out to purge from his land had taken over his home and were defiling it with their debauchery. But what sent him over the edge was the fact that his beloved wife was in the middle of it all. The Count went into a blind rage and killed every heretic present at that sinful gathering, but in the end, he couldn't bring himself to kill his wife. She knew this, too, because she broke into a knowing smile afterwards, which caused the Count to sink into a spiral of despair. He tries to take his own life by driving his sword into his chin, but at that moment, his blood activates the behelet in his possession and summons the God Hand. The Count rejoices at their appearance. He doesn't know if they are angels sent from heaven or demons ascended from hell, but he doesn't care. All he wants is deliverance from his suffering, and they promise it to him, a life without grief or sorrow marked only by strength and pleasure in exchange for a simple phrase. 
The Count sacrifices his wife, the object of his love and hatred, and becomes an apostle for the first time. We say first time because the Count has actually used his Behelet to summon the God Hand twice, and so far he's the only character to have done so. Every other apostle was granted their powers at the time of their ascendance, except Emperor Ganishka's Shiva form, an evolution forced through artificial means. If Slug Count had gone through with reincarnating a second time, who knows what it would have meant for the world, because a reincarnation being reincarnated again was an abomination unheard of. Sadly, or perhaps thankfully, we never find out the result of a double ascendance via traditional means. As the God Hand, and Femto in particular, continue to press the Count into making a decision, Void instinctively senses that his heart has been swayed. His once strong desire to live vanished in the face of having to sacrifice his only link to humanity, Teresia, and thus the Count committed his soul to the Abyss. As the Vortex of Souls came to take him away to Hell, we see that Vargas was a part of the Damned who dragged the Count to his destiny, implying that his curse had worked. All that remained of the Apostle Slug after the Interstice disappeared was his upper body and a legacy of hatred and retribution, as his daughter Teresia made Guts the object of her ire. Witnessing such profound things happening was enough to break the mind of a grown adult, but for Teresia, the equation was simple. Her father would not have died had the Black Swordsman not shown up. She vows to personally kill Guts one day, and the Black Swordsman dares her to bring it in. But the last page of Guardian Angels of Desire 6 shows Guts' despair at having spread his legacy of hatred to her as well. The Slug Count's life was marked with a fanatical devotion to everything that ostensibly made him a great man in that day and age. He was a loving father, husband, and ruler, and though he was a bit harsh in his treatment, his heart's desire was to see his people prosper. He ended his life as a demonic apostle who had already sacrificed his wife in exchange for power and life, and would have done so again if the intended sacrifice was anyone but his daughter. His story perfectly embodies the evil and paradoxical nature of an apostle's existence. You'd be hard pressed to find such nuanced side characters in any other manga series that isn't titled Berserk. Marvelous Verdict. And that's it for this video. Unfortunately, the slug count is missing from both anime adaptations of Berserk. We think that that's a travesty because his story is crucial to understanding not only how Guts thinks, but also how demons work on a fundamental level in Berserk. Not to mention the fact that his character design is far more iconic and terrifying than the hideous Keeper of the Hounds that we had in the 2016 adaptation. The slug count will always be remembered as one of Berserk's better side characters because his story highlights the hallmarks of Miura's art. Hard-hitting, complex, paradoxical, and yet utterly human. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, be safe out there, and thanks for watching.